We're studying Joshua, the life of Joshua, not just the book of Joshua, but we're looking at the life of Joshua because there's much to learn from a, a man like this. This was a man who shows us that he was positioned for promise. Now, you all know that there's a book of Joshua, as I just mentioned, uh, that comes uh, uh, that comes after the five uh, Levitical books or the five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then comes Joshua, and it talks about uh, the transition for, that, the, that the people of Israel take into possessing the promised land. You know, the wall of Jericho and marching around seven times and all those things to the walls come tumbling down. And going into Canaan to possess the land after the Egyptian bondage and after the Red Sea crossing and all those things. So, so that's uh, the book of Joshua. But Joshua's story begins long before that. And I wanted to, uh, uh, whenever you're studying in the Bible, if you're looking for a topic or a word that you want to study, there's a rule uh, 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 that you need to apply. And it's called the rule of the law of first mention. So in every, you, you, like, if you look at a word like love and you want to study what the Bible has to say about love, then the rule is that you go to when the word love was first used in Scripture. And that's your starting point. So it's the law or the rule of first mention. So I want to talk to you today about um, when Joshua is first mentioned. And he is here in this passage in the book of Exodus, a couple of books over from Joshua. So there's a lot that happens between when, when Joshua first first enters the scene into the fulfillment of what his life was all about. So Exodus chapter 24 verses 9 through 18, and it reads as so. It says, Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there and I will give you tablets of stone and the law of the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. And here comes Joshua. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua. And Moses went up to the mountain of God and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Sound familiar? Amen. Amen. If it doesn't, we'll get to it. He said, indeed, Aaron and her are with you. And any, if any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on the Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went up into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 days. Nights. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing and above all doing of his word. You may be seated, those of you who are standing in the house of the Lord. So we're talking about being positioned for promise. So number one, our first point is you must be positioned with God's timing. So looking at Joshua, the name Joshua means the Lord saves. It is, it is also the name that we come to know, uh, uh, the name Hoshea which where is where we get the name Jesus. It means Jehovah is salvation. The Bible tells us that he's from the tribe of Ephraim. The name Ephraim means fruitfulness, literally means fruitfulness. Genesis 41 and 52 says, and the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now this is Joseph. Uh, Ephraim is the, tri or the tribe of Ephraim is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Are you following me? They're one of, so, they're, so Jacob had these 12 sons, and then, uh, and, and then out of those sons, we get the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, who come from the tribe of Joseph. 
Joseph received two portions of the tribe and uh, of tribes and were split into two and they are called Manasseh and Ephraim. Now Ephraim is the youngest son of the captivity. He was born in Egypt. So Ephraim was born in Egypt. He's the younger one. And in fact, when Jacob comes to, to, to lay hands to give a blessing to all of the children of the tribe, uh, he skips over Manasseh to bless Ephraim. Even when, even when Joseph says, wait a minute, that's not the right son. But, but Jacob and God's providence knew what he was doing. So, so, so here we see uh, that Joshua is from that lineage. He's from that tribe of Ephraim. He's from the tribe of fruitfulness. I hope you guys are trekking with me. The Bible said that Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the seven men of Israel. So, so Moses went up with these elders uh, and these representatives of all the tribes, and he gets to the point uh, um, where it's time to separate and then he and Joshua are to go forward. So what I want to, the point I want to make about the name of Joshua and the name of Ephraim is that uh, since Joshua's name means the Lord saves or Jehovah is salvation and Ephraim's name means fruitfulness, that means that God doesn't just want to save us, he wants us to be fruitful. He doesn't just want to save us, he wants us to be blessed. He doesn't want, just want to save our lives, but he wants us to actually have a life that is blessed. Amen. Jesus said, John 10 and 10, he said, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give life and to give it abundantly. So that means, so that doesn't mean that God just wants us to, to, to get saved and, and have life in eternity, but he wants us to live a blessed life while we're still here in the natural so, so the God who saves is also the God who blesses and the God who has a promise to make us fruitful. Um, interesting thing, Joshua's, Joshua is also called the son of Nun. Jesus himself was a son of Nun as well. Notice the spelling in your, in your notes. Uh, Joshua was the son of Nun. Some of you with a Catholic background say, wait a minute, I thought that nuns couldn't have children. They were supposed to be celibate. No, that's not his mother, that's his father. His father's name was Nun. But with an interesting play on words, we notice that Jesus was also the son and Nun. Son of Nun. What, that, what I mean by that is that nobody can, can claim exclusively Jesus Christ, but all can, ex, ex, can claim explicitly Jesus Christ. None can lay an exclusive claim to Christ. No one can say, well, Christ belongs to us. He's ours. We're special. Nobody can, can make that claim. Are you following me? But we all explicitly can make the claim for Christ. Christ is ours and we are his. You don't believe me? Let's look at, the Let's look at your notes. Galatians chapter 3, 27, 28. It says, for many of you were baptized. We had baptism last week, right? For many of you who were baptized into Christ have also put on Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So what that means is that none of us have VIP position with Jesus. None of us have a, a, a better relationship with Jesus based on who we are than the person sitting next to us. Listen, if, if folks could just get a hold of this scripture and just lay hold of it, then we wouldn't have problems. We wouldn't need any of these special activist groups. We wouldn't need no feminist groups. We wouldn't need no. Uh, we wouldn't need any any groups and, and activists for all these other types of things. If we would just take heed to what the Word of God says, God says that all are important, equally important. Now we have different roles to play. We have been we have been uh, uh, gifted in different ways, and, and we've been purposed uh, for different things. But we're all side of God. He says in the body of Christ, there's no Jew nor Greek. I don't care where you came from. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? That's what really matters. And that's all that matters. Doesn't matter where you came from. What matters is where you're going. And are you going with Christ? So don't get caught up on, on, on what your birthrights are and all those things. You need to be reborn anyway. He said there's neither Jew nor Greek, and then also there's neither slave nor free. 
That's not a slave no, nor free. And then big one right here. That's not the male nor female. Did you catch that? That's what the word of God says. The Christian religion has done more for, for feminine rights than any other religion has ever done. I hope you guys know and understand that, you know, and, and please don't, don't get caught up in, 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 in what the world tries to put on us uh, to say that there's some kind of a, 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 a of, of uh, discrimination in the church as it pertains to women. Now, some people do things and, and of course that is, but that's not the biblical mandate. Right. Now, we don't ordain women at pastors. Because that's according to what the scripture says. But it doesn't mean that women can't teach. I've learned some of the best lessons from women Bible teachers. And ladies, you don't have to have a title to serve God. Hello? You don't need, you don't need a title. You don't need to be called pastor to, 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 to serve God. A pastor means that you are a servant, a minister. So you can serve God and you can minister. And if you have a gift of teaching, then by all means, please step up and teach. Are you following me? But what God is talking about, he's talking about headship. You got two heads, you got a muster. <laughs> and it just so happened that God said that the man should be the head of the, of the household. The man should be the head of his wife. But that does not mean that the man is greater than the wife. That means that the man it should be the first one to give up all of his rights so that everybody else is taken care of. So I don't know how you grew up, but, but, but being the head of the house meant you get the big chicken. Don't nobody sit in daddy's seat and daddy get the big piece of chicken and all that kind of stuff. That's not necessarily what the Bible says. What being the head means is that if we only got a little food, guess who don't eat? Don't eat. That's right. Amen. Amen. You understand? That's what biblical headship means. It means you're the first, yeah, you first, all right, you're the first to sacrifice. You're the first to get. You see, you see my house around Christmas, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Where's Kathy at? Because I don't want to get in trouble. See, I hear her out there. She's listening. Y'all don't tell her. The year before last, they threw my gift away. Went to clean up all the stuff. I had all these nice gift cards. I was all ready to go to all these places. Gift cards was nice and everything. But when it came time to clean up everything, guess what got thrown out with all of the bags and all of the, the paper and stuff? My gift was gone. Everybody else is having fun, playing with everything. But, but that's okay. That's what, they, that's what daddies do, right? We sacrifice. Amen? So it's a matter of getting the thing in order. God's way and we're better together. We make this thing work together. Amen. So 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 what so what God is what we're saying here, Jesus was a son of none. He's not exclusively, but he doesn't exclusively belong to anybody, but he explicitly belongs to everybody. So back to the back to the point. This is you must be positioned for God's timing. So let's look at the timing. The God's timing is that the mountain that we're talking about, it comes after the covenant is established. If we look at the previous verses, we see that the people have heard the commands of the Lord and what they said, according, according to verse uh, according to verse 7, he said, when, when he, Moses, he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, somebody say, they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. So Moses reads to them from the book of the law, reads to them with the word of the Lord, and they said, we'll sign up, we'll take that deal. We'll be baptized, we'll do what we need to do, we'll be circumcised, whatever we need to do, we agree to the covenant. Whenever you see the word covenant, replace it with the word relationship. We are not a religious entity. We are not, uh, 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 I'm not a religious leader. I'm a relationship leader. We are, we are in the business of relationships, not in the business of being religious. Whenever you see covenant, we're talking about relationship. So before the mountain, before the mountain which leads to the promise, before that, there must be relationship. There must be agreement on both parts 
to agree to the rules and the confines of the relationship, of the covenant agreement. So the people have said yes. Somebody say yes, Lord. Yes. So the people have said yes, and now they're headed toward the mountain. But hold up. Wait a minute. There's a wilderness experience. See, the covenant is established in the wilderness. Did you notice that? The covenant is not established in the promised land. It's established before the promised land. God wants to know where you stand in times of difficulty. He wants to know where you stand in times when things aren't going your way. He wants to know, can he trust you with just the promise? Oh, Thomas, you believe because you have seen. But blessed are those, Thomas, Jesus told Thomas, but blessed are those who believe who have not seen. See, the, the relationship truly begins before the money starts rolling in. The relationship, the covenant needs to be established before we buy the new house. The, the covenant needs to be established before we start having children. The covenant needs to be established before we retire. The covenant needs to be established before the milk and honey. The covenant is, it needs to be established when we're setting up the foundation for what we want in the future. That's the excitement of the wedding. That's the excitement when we march down the aisle. That's the excitement and that's the scary part because we don't know, but we believe. And that's why we make the commitment to say, to death, do us part. Ain't no such thing as irreconcilable differences. See, some folks say, I take thee for now. <laughs> as long as everything is the way it is today, then we're good. But after a while, now we have irreconcilable differences. Listen, it tickled me when I used this analogy before because I turned on the radio that very week and another pastor was using the exact same analogy. I said, that must be the Holy Spirit because I know he, he didn't hear my message, but, but he used the exact same thing. And the, the analogy he used, the reconcilable difference I like to use is how you roll the toothpaste at your house. You can get to a fight over toothpaste. I like to roll it from the bottom. My wife like to squeeze it however it come out. That little, you know, how it get dry, you know, the leftover and it gets dry and all crusty and stuff and all that. All that. I can't stand that. That drives me nuts, right? But hey, she's a squeezer. Just come out, how's it gonna come out? That is an irreconcilable difference. That never gonna change. No matter what we do, no matter what we've done, what we try, whatever, that is never going to change. Now we just got two toothpaste. I got mine, you got yours. <laughs> the point is, in any relationship, there are going to be some irreconcilable differences. See, and for the most part, those irreconcilable differences are what attracted you to them in the first place. See, in the beginning, opposites attract. But as you go along, opposites attack. <laughs> Come on, ladies. We, I got a group of women I'm talking to. You, you know what I'm talking about. When, when you were dating a joker, it was all right. You come over his house, and, and you like to clean up after him and, and do all that. He thought that was just so wonderful. You, you know, you come over, you, you help make his house neat and perfumes and all that kind of stuff. You do all that kind of stuff for him and everything because you're trying to win the dude. I know how that's no game, recognized game, you know. And he's doing stuff to try to, you know, to try to please you and all that stuff. But after you get married, you've been with him for a while, you talk, boy, pick up that stuff. Clean up after yourself. Put those shoes away. Now, now it's a problem. Are you following me? But that, but 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 see, but that's what the, the covenant needs to be established early on so God can know whether He can trust you when He blesses you. So the wilderness is a time of transition. It's a time for what you used to be to what God is making you into. Come on, church, help me now. 
help me out in this place. Somebody say, God's not through with me yet, but he has started. See, see, see the, the wilderness is that time from when what you used to be as you're being transformed into what you're going to be. You're on your way. You're not there yet. You're not a finished product. You're still in the process called sanctification. You're still being made holy on a day-to-day basis. There's some stuff that you're working on and that you're working towards to get through. You're not there yet, but you're not yet. You're not yet what you used to be. And thank God that we're not what used to be but that's the wilderness in the wilderness there's uncertainty you guys are familiar with the story they they've been released from the bondage of Egyptian slavery and Egyptian slavery was hard work it was crazy it was wild it was it was, it was, it was it, I mean it was the worst and God delivered them from that and showed them great wonders and they came across the, 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 the Red Sea on the bottom on dry land. I don't know what the big, bigger miracle was. Was that he parted the sea or that the, the ground was wet? The Bible said that they came through on dry land. You know the significance of that? Is that they didn't have to bring nothing else with them. They didn't have to carry. There was nothing latched on to their feet holding on to keep them back and remind them what they But in all minds they said, oh you brought us out here to die. Won't we off with the leeks and the onions. Leeks and onions were slave food. were not we better off chitlins? God said, I got milk and honey for you, but you want top ramen. Now top ramen to get you through. Man. I'm just saying. <laughs> Folks have done some things with top ramen that will blow your mind. You know, I think I saw top ramen on top shelf. When, yeah, they they do all so ramen will get you through, but 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 ramen is not supposed to be the the, the delicacy. God said, I got delicacy for you. Now, as good as top ramen is, it takes from Ruth Chris. <laughs> Come on, anybody been to Ruth Chris? Oh, not enough people. Well, we gotta make a road trip. Road trip. One of these Sundays, we packing up, we going to Root Chris. We have a church at Root Chris on one of these Sundays. Y'all coming with me? Y'all coming with me? <laughs> but Robin don't compare to that. God said, I got, I got Root Chris over here, but you won't top Robin. Because, because, see, once we get out of the thing, sometimes we forget how bad it was. We get out of a bad relationship and, and then we start remember we only remember the good parts of the relationship we were in. We, you know, I was, uh, what was that? I was, I forgot what I was watching, but a guy was saying, yeah, yeah, I really miss whatever the, the, his girlfriend's now. I, I really miss her. And his friends were like, what are you talking about? I said, like, oh man, I missed her. She was, she was great. Said, but, 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 but she tried to blow up your car. <laughs> He said, oh, man, she, you just don't know her. And the guy said, the friend said, but you were still in it. <laughs> he, he forgot how crazy the relationship was. And, that, and that's what the, the children of Israel were dealing with. They forgot how bad bondage was. They said, oh, we were better off in bondage. Because now we're out here in the wilderness. And in the wilderness, there's uncertainty. See, see, see you know, and this happened even during... Uh, uh, slavery time here. They were so slave they didn't want to run. They said, what, what do we have better out there than what we have here? You running for freedom and all what we could just stay here in the bondage. But thank God for those who resisted that temptation to stay in their mess and fought for the freedom, not just for their freedom, but for the freedom of all. But there's some people that say, hey, I got three hots in a cot. Everything is done for me. I, you know, there is a, a, a part of slavery that, that can become comfortable. You don't have to worry about bills. You don't have to worry about those kinds of things that, 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 and this is why some of our young people have a failure to launch because they're scared in, of the uncertain and the unknown right but you know how they teach eagles to fly they drop them out of the nest <laughs> they drop them out of the nest oh you don't want to get up out of here Boo! then they'll fly down and catch them just before they hit the ground, but eventually they open up those wings 
and they fly. Amen. Amen. The wilderness is a time of transition. It's a time between what you used to be and what you will become. Exodus verse 10. The Bible says, watch this. These leaders that were, that were with Moses, he said, And they saw God, the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. They saw some sort of evidence of God's presence. In biblical understanding, we call this either theophany or Christophany. The, the word Christophany, it means a manifestation of God in the Bible that is tangible to the human senses, often in human form, or of a precarnate pre Christ. A lot of times you see the phrase, then the angel of the Lord appeared. Most theologians would say that that was a preeminent Christ, a preincarnate Christ. Christ. So in some way, shape, form, or fashion, they saw God in a way that they can comprehend. Now that does not conflict with, Ex with Exodus 33, which said, God said, you cannot see my face, nor for a man should not see me and live. God clearly said, you cannot see my face and live. But this is not a, a, a contradiction of those two verses. What's happening here is they saw some sort of evidence. They saw sort of manifestation that, that caused them to see evidence of a true God. Is that all right? Is, is that a clear enough understanding of what they saw? So uh, we don't know if they saw God's face literally like that, but they saw something that convinced them that it was God. See, God will show you himself and you'll be totally convinced that it was God. God will deliver you from something. God will intervene in your affairs. He'll do something and, and he'll put his stamp on it that you would know that it was him that you saw. It was him that performed the action in your life. Amen. The Bible said they saw it and they ate and drank. Somebody said they got lit. <laughs> Eat and drink means, uh, basically means they had a celebration. They saw the face of God and they celebrated. Listen, when you see God's face, when you come to a salva salvation knowledge of Jesus Christ, you, you, it, that's a reason to celebrate. That's a cause for celebration. That's a cause to throw a party. When you see God, listen, can you remember when you first saw God? I mean, some of us were raised in church. I wasn't. Some of us were raised in church, we went to church, and, and we went through all the classes and Sunday school and, and did all that. But there's a point in each one of our lives when we got to see God for ourselves. There's a point in, in every single person's lives. It's true of your children, it's true of your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, those who may have them. It's true of every single individual that everyone has to come to see God for themselves. Doesn't matter how much they read in the book, doesn't matter how many field trips they go on, doesn't matter how many uh, 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 units they complete in the disciple, the disciple town curriculum, how many BBS programs they go to. At some point, every single person has to see God personally for themselves for him to become real. Doesn't matter how many sermons you hear, doesn't all those things don't matter. What matters is when you come to that place where you know God personally. When you know God personally. I remember in my early 20s when I got real serious about the Lord and serious about the things of God. I've always believed in God from the time. For as long as I can remember, I always believed in God. But it wasn't until uh, my teens and my, my early 20s that I really, when God really became real. One of the things I started to do was I started to redefine what my relationship was. Folks would say, man, I heard you were a Christian. I said, no, I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I needed to say that because I needed to remind myself of what it was all about. I, it, it wasn't just a check mark that I put on some application or something. It wasn't just a Facebook status that, that, that you know, if, if that was around back then, it wasn't. It, it wasn't any of those things. It wasn't, it wasn't a license plate or, or a bumper sticker. It wasn't, it wasn't about just saying I was a Christian. I had to remind myself that this thing was about having a relationship with, G, with God through Jesus Christ. Christ. For by grace we've been saved, according to Ephesians 2 and 8. By grace we've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, lest any, not of works, lest any man should boast. That was a constant reminder to 
myself of the relationship that I was now in and claiming. And what it would do would cause other people to ask me about that definition and give me the opportunity to tell them and share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when you see God for yourself, it's a cause for celebration. Point number two, you must be positioned with God's leading. The Bible said in verse 12, it said, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me to the mountain and be there. Let's look at this real closely. God will call you to the place he wants you to be. God will call you to the place he wants you to be. If you have that covenant relationship, remember it begins with covenant, it begins with relationship, it begins with you having saying yes to the Lord. Once you say yes to the Lord, now you're able to hear his voice. Now you're able to seek his voice and actually find and hear what he has to say. And if you're listening, then he's going to call you to the place that he wants you to be. Now if you are here this morning by accident, God has called you to the place that he wanted you to be. You don't go throughout your day without being in the place that God has called you to. You're not just working at that job just because you applied and got the job. God has called you to the place that he wants you to be. You may not even like your job, but God has called you to the place that he wants you to be. You may want to go to a different school, but God has called you to the place that he wants you to be. Why? Because the Bible said that the good, that the of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. So God is ordering your steps. If you are a child of God, God is ordering your steps. He's calling you to a place that he wants you to be. But when you get there, make plans to be there. <laughs> the promise may take a while. <laughs> Look what he says in the text. He said, come to me on the mountain and be there. See, see, I almost read right past that, but 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 it caught my eye and it kind of it, it started to glow when I was looking at the text. It said, "Wait a minute, be there." What that means is be prepared to be there for a while. Some of us have been in the place that God has called us to be for a while, and we've yet to see the promise that we've been waiting for. But the Bible said, "Blessed are them that wait on the Lord, for they shall renew their strength." They shall up on wings as eagles, they should run and not enter. So get there and be there and plan on being there for a while. How long? Till the promise comes. Lord, I'm waiting on you till the promise comes. How long are you going to stay there? How long are you going to keep doing that? How long are you going to keep praying? How long are you going to keep worshiping? How long are you going to keep reading? How long are you going to keep doing what you're doing? I'm going to be here until the promise comes. Comes. I'm standing on the promises of God and I'm looking past all the diversions, all the distractions because I'm standing on the promise of the God. What you doing? Standing on the promise of the God. See, that's my B-boy stands. Y'all remember they, the B-boy said, I'm standing on the promises of God. And I'm going to be here. I am going to be here until the promise comes. I won't be moved. I'm steadfast and movable, always abounding in him. That means I'm not yet there, but I am right here. And where is here? The place that God has called me to be. See, that's the life of the believer. That's the walk of faith. Talked about it last week. Faith is not about a feeling. It's a decision. You can't feel faith. Faith is a decision that you make. See, 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 if you go according to your feelings, then you're not, you're not walking according to faith. Because your feelings will tell you to go left, right, turn around, do it over, all that stuff. But by faith, faith is doing what God tells you to do, even though you don't feel like doing it. It's making a conscious choice and decision to do what God has called you to do, as opposed to what you want to do. Or as opposed to what other people want you to do. That's what faith is. I'm making a conscious choice and decision to follow after God. I'm making a conscious choice and decision to live my life according to his commandments. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 10.36 says, but you have need of endurance. So after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Say so you're going to need endurance. You, see, the child of God, what we need, we need endurance. <laughs> what we need is a little perseverance. What we need is a little patience. Yeah. 
That's why one of the fruit of the Spirit, one of the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. Long-suffering <laughs> long really means to suffer long for a long time. It's not just a little bit of suffering. It's a long suffering. That's why it's called long sufferings. So well, we ready to, well, I've been here. I've been waiting on this all this time. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Well, how long have you been waiting? Five minutes. <laughs> Should be here by now. Should be done through right now. And that's why so few people get, get zealous for the Lord and they get excited. And, you know, at baptism or, or at the altar, they get excited and they say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. And they give it one try. And then after they start to lose heart. But the Bible said you need endurance. You need long suffering. And let's look at it. It's long suffering. It's not, it's not long chilling. It's long suffering. The Bible said blessed day that wait on the Lord. When you're waiting, you're waiting in hopeful expectation. That's what faith is. You're waiting in hopeful expectation. You're not just sitting around doing nothing. You're preparing for the promise that God is going to deliver. Amen? So even if the promise hadn't happened yet, see the wilderness is a time of transition, and the transition transition is to be used for preparation. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's right. And it's not to prepare the blessing for you, it's to prepare you for the blessing. God has it in his power to bless you right now. He has the power to change your situation on a dime. All he has to do is snap his proverbial fingers and everything in your life can change. And guess what? I'm here to tell you that's exactly how it happens in the heavens. The moment God says it, it's done. The problem for us is we don't live in the heavens yet. <laughs> the problem is that we still exist within time and eternity. We still, we're still governed by clocks and calendars. Are you following me? So, so, but God is not prohibited by such things. He's the creator of those things. So, so whatever God does, he does it instantaneously. You know, I, I, I think about this with folks who have a problem with the six days of creation. I have absolutely no problem with the six days of creation. Well, perhaps I do. Well, I'll take that back. I do have a problem with a six-day Creation. I'm talking about literal six days, 24-hour period. The problem of I, what I had is why did God take so long? That's the question. It's not a problem, but that, that would be the question I have. Lord, why did you take six days when you could have did it in none? See, but you have folks who are argumentative. Lord didn't do it in six days. Why couldn't he? If he could do it at all. Then how could you try to limit him by how long it would take? Yeah, he could do it, but you can't do it in six days. I believe that he could have done it in a millisecond. So my question would be, Lord, what took you so long? Why did you take so long? Because everything has purpose, according to the Lord. Amen? See, patience positions us to receive the promise. Last point, you must be positioned with godly leaders. Don't worry, I'm not going to take an offering. I got to say that because this, this kind of stuff get nervous. If you have certain type of religious backgrounds, people start getting nervous. You, you, I, I've seen that. I've been, I've seen, people start getting religious. You talk about leadership. Leaders, godly leaders. That means that it's about to be an honorarium or, or something that, that needs to be. That's not coming. We already received the offering, and it's good, and, and it's blessed. But, but you do need to be positioned with godly leaders. And this is what I love about Joshua, and this is the point we're going to make about him today. The Bible says, so most rose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up to the mountain of God Joshua was Moses' personal assistant assistant means to be a helper one who provides aid or relief or to serve I wonder if I have any assistants in the congregation today I'm sure I do or maybe I don't I get no amens are we, are we not working together Amen. I'm going to try that again. I wonder if I got any assistance in the house. Amen. Hey, man. Now, there, there we are. There we are. There, there. I wasn't setting you up for nothing. See? Amen. <laughs> wasn't about to ask you to do nothing. I'm just saying. But look, we must have a servant's heart. This is Joshua. 
You must have a servant's heart. Verse 14, he says, and he said to the elders, y'all wait here. I'm paraphrasing. So you guys, you, you guys have a seat. You wait here too. Uh, 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 and we will come back to you. Let me get back to that point, y'all. Does that sound familiar? Y'all remember Genesis chapter, uh, 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 Genesis talking about Abraham. Abraham went up with his son Isaac and he had the helpers with him. He said, you guys wait here. Me and the boy will be back. Same, same thing. See, this is, this is a, a, a prologue or a precursor to the coming Christ. He said, we're going up the mountain and we'll be back. In, Isaac, in, in Abraham and Isaac's case, Isaac was being taken up the mountain to be sacrificed. And Abraham was fully convinced that that's what he was going to do. But yet, in, his, in, in the fullness of his faith, he believed that somehow, some way, him and the boy were going to return. Now that's faith, y'all. Amen. 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 I just got to be talking about faith. That is faith right there. That, that, that he didn't understand. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't see the end from the beginning. He had no clue of what was. All he knew he was going up to sacrifice his son. But the, him and his son was coming back. Some way, somehow. I don't know if he's ever saw anybody raised from the dead before. I don't know if he watched The Walking Dead every week or whatever. If he believed in zombies or vampires. I don't know what he did. But whatever he, he believed that somehow he was coming back. So here we see the same type of statement being made by Moses. He said, you are all you elders, all you position people with positions and titles, all of you folks who need to be sitting in the front row wherever you go, you need to be ushered in, you need to be announced, you need to be, uh, uh, you need to tell how many, uh, how many folks are in your congregation. He said, all of you folks, y'all way here. And me and my assistant, my lowly servant, uh, my, my note keeper, my helper, my aide, he's going to come up to a place with me. See, I, in all the times I read the Bible, I didn't really catch that Joshua went with him until I was studying for this series. That's why I say we read the Bible over and over and God reveals something new. And I'd already just kind of read past that. And then when I was studying for this series and looking serious at the life of Joshua, I said, wait a minute, Joshua was right there. Doesn't say anything about Joshua right here. Doesn't say what kind, what kind of character he had. All it said that he was an assistant. And we know that an assistant is someone who helps out. Someone who serves. Someone with, he doesn't need a big title to serve. He doesn't do all things. Look at who was left behind. The Bible said that Aaron, Moses' brother, Nadab and Abihu, if you don't know who Nadab and Abihu were, they're the sons of the prophets who, who, who wanted to worship God with their own fire. Said they brought strange fire into uh, uh, the tabernacle. They 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 uh, they were living foul. They were eating meat that they weren't supposed to eat. They were uh, 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 engaging in activities with the women and all this stuff. They they were supposed to be servants of the Lord. These other folks. So you guys in the seventh. So you guys who stay here will be back. See, God is looking for people who desire to make His name great. Not for those who desire to make a name for themselves. God's looking for people who are willing to make his name great. Desire to make his name great. Not for those who want to make a name for themselves. But, but the beautiful thing is when you make God's name great, he'll make your name great by association. Last month we lost a spiritual giant. In the history of the world, the Reverend Billy Graham. If you watched any of the homegoing services or heard anybody say anything about him, if anybody has a great name in the history of these United States, Billy Graham has a great name. But you know what he's dedicated his life to? Making his name great. Not once would he try to make his own name great. He's dedicated his life to making the name of the Lord great. Pointing people in the direction of Christ. Despite what the situation was. He was at the forefront of civil rights movement. He was one of the first to desegregate his crusades. 
said that if the black people can't sit with us, then we won't come and have our crusade there. That takes courage. So it's easy to do stuff like that now. You know, it's, it's trendy to, to take a stand. You can take a stand for anything now. And people are woo, you're so courageous. But in those times, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy. It wasn't as simple as posting something on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. And now we take a stand for everything. We take a stand for uh, school, send me to sit home. Uh, it's, it's all, I almost lost it on this one. They stay home, and y'all don't get mad at me. I know some of y'all might get mad at me. But I'm saying it anyway. Y'all know me better than I'm saying. They send home a fundraiser. They raise, bring in blankets for dogs. They, they collecting blankets for dogs. I said, Whoa! <laughs> I said, I'm probably not going to do that. <laughs> they got fur, right? <laughs> I mean, some of y'all dog lovers, y'all mad at me. Like, I'm like, well, mm -hmm. my ruffy needs a, you do you, I'm going to do me. Amen? You do you, I I'm going to do me. But my point is, we, we make causes out of everything. Now, fundraising for dog blankets now, when, you know, when people need blankets. I'm, I'm just a little more concerned about people needing blankets and things like that. And you know, you know, God gave dogs blankets. It's called fur. <laughs> on a serious tip, though, I do believe that we should take care of animals. So y'all don't call PETA or nobody on me. God gave us dominion over the earth. That means that we care for our the animal kingdom and all that stuff. But they ain't people. That's let's leave it at that. Amen. Move on, Pastor Chuck, because Ruffy is. <laughs> Amen. So what was said? So Moses, he said, God will make your name great by association. In the last verse, verse 18, it says, So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So in other words, Joshua was receiving on-the-job training. A, a couple of years ago, I think I Instagrammed that 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 verse right there because I was up at the uh, Etiwanda Preserve and and uh, it was early in the morning and as I looked up at the mountains over there um, at the Etiwanda Preserve I looked up in the mountain and there was this cloud just floating over there and it, and it brought my attention to this verse because it said that Moses went into the midst of the cloud and, and I was heading into that midst of the cloud and, and, and this is not a verse that, you know, this is not one of my memory verses, but, but for some reason this verse popped into, uh, popped into my mind and I turned to it and I made a post and I, I used that as the caption because it said Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain and Moses was in the mountain for 40 days. Now I, I didn't stay 40 days or 40 nights, I stayed about 40 minutes once I got to the top when I was ready to walk back down but this reminded me uh, the cloud is God's glory the cloud is God's presence wherever God goes his glory goes with him are you catching that wherever the presence of the Lord is his glory goes with them he is magnified he's magnified wherever he goes he's not minimized wherever he goes what am I saying, church? That if God is going with you, then guess what? You should magnify him wherever you go. Don't ever fall into the trap or into the political correctness of minimizing your God in places that you go. Come on now. I'm preaching. I'm saying something right now. I'm getting ready to close. Somebody, nobody, you ain't supposed to as a preacher, but, but I'm going to say that. I'm getting ready to close, but wherever you go, God should be lifted up. He should be magnified. David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Don't ever fall into the political correctness that says minimize God in the workplace. Minimize God in the school. Minimize God in public settings. Keep that to yourself. No, I can't keep it to myself because this is myself. This is who I am. I am a worshiper of the Lord God Almighty. I can't do nothing but magnify Him. I can't do anything but glorify His name. I can't do anything but lift Him up wherever I go. I can't minimize something so big. I can, if your God is so small that you can put him in your pocket, that you 
can minimize them when you want and maximize like a computer screen, the little button, minimize and maximize. No, God is the screensaver. I'm trying to tell you. He is the screensaver and he's the way maker. He's the miracle worker. He's the redeemer. He's your salvation. He's your refuge. He is your comforter, your healer. He is your provider. He is your victory. He is your deliverance. He is the way maker, strong tower. You can't minimize God. You think we got a building that can hold God? <laughs> can't hold him. Joshua was getting on the job training. Just this passage of scripture tells you why Joshua would be chosen to take the people into the promised land. Because he was positioned for the promise. And the position that he was in was in the position to follow. Because you can't lead unless you're willing to follow. Don't ever follow a leader that ain't willing to follow anyone. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. If a leader wants you to submit to what he wants you to do, but he don't want to submit to what he's being called to do, you don't follow that leader. Are you following me? Joshua was being prepared for leadership. And the way that he did that was fellowship. He knew to follow godly leaders. He knew that if he stayed close to Moses, then God will reveal to him what, his, what the purpose and plan for his life was. He didn't know he was going to take over. He didn't know what was going, would go down with Moses. He didn't know that Moses, he had no clue of what the future was going to be. I had no clue that I was going to start a church. No clue. No, on, on a real funny, no desire. Start a church? Nope, not me. You know how difficult it is to start a church? Huh? Let me find one that's already started, you know? <laughs> that's going pretty good, whatever, and jump in there and see what happened. Huh? But, but start one from scratch? Are you crazy? You gotta be out of your mind you wanna start a church if you wanna start a church. You, cr you crazy. Don't, don't follow anybody that says, hey, I wanna I want start a church. Nah, well, you don't start it without me. I, if, you want to, I ain't try. if God told you, then. That's a whole different thing. It's a whole different thing. So what happens with Joshua. He, 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 he didn't know what he was getting into. All he knew is that he needed to stay close to godly leaders. Amen. Praise God for godly leaders. Amen. Praise God for godly leaders. Amen. Don't, you know, it's, it seems like everybody's ready to tear down men and women of God. Time they make a mistake. It's all over the news. They just... Criticize and criticize and all these kind of things, but praise God for godly leaders. There are godly leaders in this world. There are people who have subjected themselves to the will of God, have given up their own comforts so that they can comfort others, made sacrifices for the good of the body of Christ. And we should, we should honor them. We should honor them. Amen? Amen. Joshua received on the job training. He was right there. Moses' sidekick. He's learning. He's, he, he's, he's, he's learning on the job. If we want to be positioned for the promised church, then we got to get on the job. Amen.